Thank you everyone for joining us for the final uh, projects exchange session. Um, this is the second session for the platforms. Um, my name is Kerry Levitt. I'm sure, I think I've met most of you. Um, I'm the platforms program manager. So we'll get right into it. Uh, our first presenter today is Bernie Pope. Um, Kerry, do, do you want me to share my screen? Oh, sorry, am I not sharing? Oh, sorry, I thought I was. Oh, great, thank you. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the um, global technologies and standards for sharing human genomics research data. Um, a short title is the Human Genomes Platform. Um, and my name is Bernie Pope, um, and I uh, work with the Australian Biocommons, um, and I'm also at the University of Melbourne. Uh, and you can see our partners. Um, there are many partners in this project. I'm not actually going to list them all in the interest of time. Um, you can see their icons there. Um, next slide, please. So the, the problem that we are solving is that um, there are tens of thousands of human genomes that have been sequenced in Australia to date, and this is predicted to grow rapidly in the next few years, tenfold by the year 2025. Global projections are that to estimate 50 million human genomes will be sequenced by the end of this year. Um, large cohorts are often needed for statistical power in research, especially in rare diseases and cancer. Um, and this necessitates national and international data sharing um, because individual research groups rarely have um, sufficient um, cohorts on their own uh, and they need to share data with others. Um, current systems in Australia for storing, analysing, describing and sharing human genome data are bespoke in-house solutions. Um, they have manual laborious systems for granting access to bona fide researchers to obtain the data and use in their own analyses um, and generally do not conform well to fair principles. Um, human genome sharing requires high levels of assurance around data access controls due to the sensitive nature of the data. Um, current inefficiencies are hampering research progress and reducing the value gained from nationally funded research genomics projects. Next slide, please. So in this project, um, we propose a solution that we are describing as a services toolbox, which is based on emerging global standards. Um, and it is um, comprised of um, five features. Um, the, the first feature is a system for identifying virtual cohorts of genomes nationally. So this describes a method whereby individual research institutes can make available the uh, metadata and data that they have in their genome cohorts. And um, we propose a mechanism to make that searchable by other researchers in the country across those cohorts to gather um, virtual cohorts together. The second component is um, semi-automation of data access request approval. At the moment, data access requests um, are achieved through a data access committees, which are located um, with uh, Institute data. These processes are generally um, quite um, laborious, manual and um, time consuming. And so um, we aim to in introduce systems that will actually improve these processes and reduce the cost to people being involved. Um, we are investigating as a third component authorization and authentication systems that are appropriate for human genome data sharing um, and that address the um, sensitive um, data requirements. Um, and in fourth component, we are looking to uh, develop streamlined methods for metadata and data upload to established international genome repositories. So this is where research data um, that is um, located in research institutes in Australia is then uploaded to international, standardly used international repositories for sharing in the world. Uh, and the fifth component is documentation and training. The outcomes and benefits of this and impact of this project are threefold. Um, the first um, of those is that this, will, uh, this project will vastly improve fairness of Australian human genome data. Um, the second, um, component is that genomic data from thousands of Australians will be shared securely and responsibly nationally and internationally, ensuring their full research value can be realised. And thirdly, the platform will provide a working template that any institution in Australia can adopt and deploy. Next slide, please. Um, so how will we build this and what technical architecture are we using? Um, 
So I'll start with the right hand side, which is where possible, we'll be adopting technologies that adhere to standards being established by the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, otherwise known as GA4GH. Um, the GA4GH is a policy framing and technical standard setting organization. Um, it seeks to enable responsible genome uh, data sharing with, uh, within a human rights framework. It consists of 600, actually more than 600 members um, across not more than 90 countries. Uh, and um, several of the partners involved in this project are members um, of the GA4GH. Um, across the actual um, subparts of the project, we'll be deploying various technologies that have been developed in nationally and internationally. These include um, the Gen3 system for data sharing and uh, developing virtual cohorts that was developed by the Institute, National Institutes of Health in the USA, um, and also Vectus, a similar system that has been developed in-house at Garvin. Um, for data access approval automation, we'll be um, considering the resource entitlement management system known as REMS, um, which is developed by CSC, IT Centre for Science in Finland. Also, we'll be considering um, the data use oversight system called DUOS from the Broad Institute um, in the USA. For auth authentication and authorization, we'll be considering passports and the authorization and authentication infrastructure from the GA4GH. Um, we also consider the research research auth uh, service RAS from the NIH, and lastly CI Logon from the National Center for Supercomputing Applications in the USA. And lastly, um, for the um, component of um, streamlining data upload to international repositories, we'll be considering to use the um, uh, EMBL EBI European Genome Phenome Archive. Um, so thank you for your time, and um, that gives us you an overview of the project. Thanks very much, Bernie. Uh, next, we have Tim Churches. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Kerry. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> yes, yeah, so the Australian Cancer Data Network is um, a project with uh, many players. The three main players are uh, uh, um, the uh, Cancer Alliance in Queensland, uh, the OSCAT uh, project at Liverpool Hospital, Southwestern Sydney local uh, health district and the uh, SAVAR project also in the same place. But we have partners in the CSRO, uh, University of Melbourne, University of Western Australia and many others too numerous to, to note. Uh, and you know that we're missing a logo at the moment. We have a competition in progress and we expect to announce a winner in, in about three weeks. The next slide, please. So the problem is uh, that we have so much clinical data these days, but so little of it is actually used for research. And as most of you probably know, over the last decade or so, clinical information systems have, have largely, largely and very much belatedly compared to other industries, replaced paper-based medical records in, in many, in fact, most healthcare settings, uh, but particularly in, in cancer care. Uh, but despite the vast amount of really detailed clinical care and outcomes data that's now being routinely captured in those systems in machine readable form, uh, there's little use of those data for uh, research purposes. The, the data is certainly being used for quality assurance purposes and healthcare management purposes, but for world class research, there's really little use. Uh, and the speed and, and extent of, of that, uh, that use is really hampered by lack of access to the data in analyzable research of any form. The back end systems are vast, sprawling, and complex, uh, and not something that most researchers can grapple with directly you know, within the lifespan of an NHMRC or ARC funded project. Uh, and also, very importantly, research really needs to involve multiple sites uh, and research results as opposed to quality assurance or health management results, uh, which is based only on data from one site is, is almost certainly biased and irre irreproducible and may actually do active harm to patients if it's used to inform uh, treatment. So we need to really be able to use these data to answer questions such as um, uh, determining the risk of cardiac to toxicity for lung and breast cancer patients following radiotherapy and chemotherapy. And that, that question itself unpacks to hundreds of, of sub-questions. Uh, what sort of variation is there in practice in, uh, across patient cohorts and treatment modalities uh, in Australia and in, in, internationally? We know that cancer care uh, is protocol driven, but there is a huge amount of variation as to what uh, patients actually receive. 
uh, and more technical uh, issues such as uh, can radiomic, that is imaging, MRI and CAT scan features extracted from uh, imaging be used to, to help predict radiotherapy outcomes in uh, specific uh, cancer patients. Next slide, please. Uh, so what we're proposing to do is uh, in this project, and this is really a, just a starting point, is to harmonise three leading ca Australian cancer data initiatives uh, with each other and also in, with uh, similar projects internationally. Uh, so the first uh, and the initiator of the project is the Australian Computer Assisted Theranostics Network. Theranostics is a portmanteau of therapeutics and diagnostics. Uh, and they've been running for about 10 years uh, at uh, Liverpool Hospital, led by Lois Holloway, who's the chief investigator on this project. Lois isn't presenting because she uh, is ill at the moment. Uh, but they have established a platform distributed meet for distributed machine learning across data drawn from quite a few different cats of critical information systems around Australia, uh, which is completely interoperable with uh, the EuroCAT initiative uh, based in the Netherlands but drawing cat, uh, similar data from uh, hospitals across Europe and a few in the US. And that's been running for about 10 years and they do machine learning on distributed uh, data routinely. But it focuses very much on radiomics and radiotherapy uh, aspects of cancer treatment. The second one, which is really the, the elephant in this project, uh, is the Cancer Alliance of Queensland, which is a clinician-led consortium, but it operates the Queensland Cancer Registry on behalf of the Department of Health. And it collects core data on every single cancer diagnosed in Queensland residents, as well as operating uh, uh, additional databases, which links those data to lots of other core uh, clinical diagnostic and outcome databases. Uh, so that's a huge uh, database, which has been running since 2004. And finally, the minnow, but the newcomer is the Cancer Variation Savar project. Uh, which I'm involved with, which is developing uh, next generation machine learning power pipelines to streamline all of this extraction and loading uh, from the, the source clinical systems uh, directly into um, uh, common data models, in particular the ONCO common da data model and its associated vocabularies. And while doing that, also developing oncology extensions to that model uh, in conjunction with key players uh, overseas. So the goal of all of this is to create a, a, a national resource, which is interoperable internationally, uh, of research-ready, syntactically and semantically uh, interoperable cancer data uh, that works with both the, the OSCAT and EuroCAT uh, uh, projects and also plugs into and operates with the, the, the very large OCO uh, uh, communities, which scan not just cancer care, but all sorts of healthcare uh, internationally. And last slide, please. Uh, so how are we going to do this? Well, we've only got, just got started, but we have some fair ideas. In fact, we have a, a, a technical workshop uh, in the fourth week of March. Uh, but basically, we're trying to use open source software stacks uh, everywhere. There's a lot of legacy software in, the, uh, in uh, some of the systems. Uh, that may not be replaced, but everything new will be open source. Uh, focusing on the usual suspects of, uh, of Python for all the data wrangling. Um, uh, using things like SQL alchemy object relational mapping, uh, uh, natural language processing via the that fabulous SPACI library, which is written by uh, an Australian, um, SQL backend agnostic, but very much the focus is on code sustainability because it's very easy to set up uh, data extraction and transformation systems which involve lots of if-then statements and are very, very hard and time-consuming and, and uh, labour-intensive to, to maintain. So we're aiming to, wherever possible, to use both simple and some, somewhat advanced machine learning methods to transform the clinical data into our target uh, common data models. Uh, and that, the reason for doing that is it enables the content matter experts, that is the clinician, data managers and so on, to participate in an ongoing fashion in the task of data transformation rather than having to engage an endless stream of uh, contract programmers to write yet more hard to maintain uh, code. Uh, that's our aim, uh, and we're, we're making some progress on, on that already. Um, and finally, uh, we're very much focusing on making a data analysis easy because common data models are great, but they do have a dirty little secret, and that is that they can be hard for researchers to use, uh, harder than uh, just a, a, a usual data table. 
So we're developing open source libraries for both R and Python, which specifically addresses that issue with respect to the cancer data, but we'll probably have uh, uh, use uh, elsewhere. Uh, so I've already mentioned the various standards, uh, the OSCAT, EuroCAT uh, interoperability specifications for distributed learning based on RDF triplets uh, and, and Sparkle queries, and the OMOP common data model and, and vocabularies, which subsume uh, very large sets of standard vocabs, uh, SNOMED CT, ICD, uh, RX norm, uh, Loink, uh, and so on and so forth. So it's very much an international uh, vocabulary set. And then finally, we're uh, leveraging LRA RBC funded projects. So we'll be using the Erica cloud hosted secure remote access health data analysis environments that are being uh, set up uh, from a, on a platform project that was funded uh, last year by ARBC, uh, where we can actually pull the data uh, and do collaborative analysis on it. Um, we're working with the CADA project around five safe governance uh, uh, workflow streamlining. Uh, all of this will be RAID enabled. Uh, I won't explain what RAID is, but it's another ARBC uh, uh, initiatives for identifying research projects. And then in the second phase of Hassander, which is a, another ARBC project to uh, make better use of uh, clinical trial data, uh, we will we intend to participate in that. Thank you. That's probably my time. Thanks very much, Jim. It's great to see all the linkages between the different projects. Um, so now we have Anitha Cannon. Thanks, Kerry. Can I just? Is that better? Okay, sorry about that. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Anita Kanan. I'm the Director for Research Platform Data Strategy at Monash University. And um, first, I want to thank ARDC for co investing and partnering with us on this project because it's realized. Uh, commitment to data governance. Um, and uh, we've got several partners up there, and I uh, thank, uh, thanks to all the partners for getting involved with this project as well. On to the next slide, please, Greg, Kerry. Thank you. Uh, before I get into the problem itself, I want to quickly touch upon what data governance covers. Um, Data governance itself is a term that includes um, the policies, roles, and responsibilities around data collection, data management, use, and data protection. And this is more uh, real, more important than ever for sensitive data. Now, for, for in terms of the problems that we are trying to address here, data governance is critically important, um, uh, particularly, but it's also quite resource intensive and time consuming. And it's critically important because there are there's a lot of shared risks between the researcher, uh, the research project, and the institution. Um, but it's a challenge to address at scale for an institution. And the scale um, is an issue from a few perspectives. One of them is the variety of data sources that that are brought um, that provide data that support research projects uh, from highly sensitive data sources. Collaboration across multi-institutional and multi-jurisdictional research projects can be challenging, and uh, research infrastructure capacity for secure uh, platforms can be a huge uh, overhead. And finally, big data and sophisticated computation requirements for projects like AI and ML uh, over genomics and imaging data sets can be challenging as well. So it's definitely an issue on several levels. Um, but what happens if we don't actually lower the barriers for data governance is that the data gets locked away in silos and um, and research groups don't really make data fair um, and uh, and without access to data all research uh, starts becoming significantly uh, constrained um, at the moment there aren't um, uh, many commercial solutions or national platforms that provide that se uh, secure trusted environment that uses existing institutional research infrastructure um, and building on uh, infrastructure like the Nectar and the Research Cloud. So um, on to the next slide, I'll talk about what we are looking at doing. So this project is going to enable uh, our partner institution to establish the secure e-research platform or SERP for short which is a comprehensive uh, platform that automates data governance uh, in a way that can scale. Uh, it's a combination 
in, in our experience, it's been a combination of technology and processes that reduces the burden of data governance on research groups, and it also de-risks the institution, uh, particularly given our uh, obligations around data protection and data breaches. Uh, in fact, so, some of our key research users now tell us that uh, they're able to sleep at night knowing that their data is protected from misuse, um, and they've been um, managing this in a quite a resource intensive way now for, for many years now before before we had uh, access to SERP. Uh, so there are two parts to SERP. Um, so in that in that box within the within uh, the dotted lines there, there's a data custodian uh, component which provides data governance and management. It allows data to be brought in, uh, data to be linked, um, allows data catalogs to be published and also uh, data extracts to be shared very securely with uh, research partners. Now, for a research user, it's the it's a second, the data analysis environment that is a remote environment with, which is configured with tools for analysis. And that environment is also controlled, monitored, and fully audited. So as a data custodian, they have full control over exactly what data goes into that in analysis environment, what data is taken out, and every action within that analysis environment is fully audited. Um, there is, uh, you know, potential to to integrate uh, with other platforms as well, and and this is something that uh, we would love to explore further and see if we can um, enable collaborations, particularly across jurisdictions and across projects um, nationally. Uh, we've got some key work packages uh, that are going to be delivered as part of this project, um, and, and I've highlighted the ones in blue there. One, the first one is the deployment of SERP um, for partners. The second are uh, onboarding of research projects, and the third is establishing a community of practice. Uh, the community of practice, I think, is going to be really useful to, to share best practices around data governance, but also tools, techniques, templates, standards. Um, and the second uh, diagram there talks about the impact uh, we're, we've, it's, it's a, I'm sorry, it's not very clear, but that's a pipeline of projects we hope to, we, we plan to onboard uh, during the course of this ARDC program and uh, across, this, across all the partners. Um, and, and one of the things I want to highlight in that is um, the data coming in uh, highlighted, if you can see this uh, when it's shared, is there's data sets coming from university partners, from government partners, from industry, and uh, uh, as well as uh, health services and uh, uh, government departments. So uh, we, we see this being useful for research across multiple domains. Um, so this slide um, is really uh, about, um, I won't go into the details, but uh, SERP has been developed at Swansea University and it's the outcome of millions of dollars of uh, millions of pounds of infrastructure investment over, over a decade. It is very mature and it has quite advanced cap uh, capabilities. What, what Mon at Monash, we have had a research collaboration with Swansea over the last two and a half years to adapt SERP for the Australian context, particularly the Nectar Research Cloud, and we have demonstrated that it can scale across the entire university. Uh, we've got over 400 users um, across domains, not just health, but um, all kinds of sensitive data uh, looking at using this platform. And our partner, Curtin University, has also developed the, the Link Smart component that uh, it's a linkage capability that exists in SERP. So we hope to be able to uh, adapt this to further to the Australian context and share that uh, as a national capability. That's it for me. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Anita. Uh, next, we have Michael Hoare. Hi, um, so I'm, I'm here to talk about the Australian text analytics uh, platform. Um, so thanks to ARDC for uh, supporting our project. Um, it's us at UQ working with uh, people at the University of Sydney and Arnett on this project. Um, so the problem we're dealing with, um, it, it's sort of um, a, a problem of connecting up the bits and getting people to use things that are already out there, I would say is a very high level summary of it. Um, so in many research disciplines, um, humanities, social sciences, uh, natural sciences, um, we actually rely on text data of some sort. Um, so it could be spoken, written, signed, multimodal forms of language and research communication. Um, and so examples of that could be something like, uh, we have language corpora in linguistics, uh, which are actually fairly structured, um, but you have gray literature, 
policy, government reports on the social sciences. Um, you have oral history interviews, uh, which are used in the humanities. Uh, you have field notes, which are used in all sorts of disciplines, geosciences, environmental sciences, and so on. Um, and when people talk about this data, uh, it's often called unstructured data. Uh, as a linguist, um, I kind of rail against that description because actually it is structured, um, but it's not structured in the way that a, a computer scientist would think. Um, and so we have to kind of match up these different worlds of what we think is structure. Um, but what we could say is across many of these disciplines, uh, researchers experience bottlenecks in text data processing, getting text uh, data sets into forms that they can work with uh, in, in a computational environment, and also with text data mining, how do they get information out of it? Um, there are lots of solutions out there, so often I, I get links to this and that. Um, one of the issues is that they're scattered across many different providers. Um, uh, many of them are actually commercial or generic, and so they're not readily uh, adaptable by researchers necessarily. Um, but another kind of uh, part of the issue is that uh, amongst Australian researchers themselves, um, there's this need for accessible training in text analytics. So people might, uh, researchers might have an interest in it, but they're just not where, not sure where to start. Um, so there's kind of a, the idea is to, to bring together users and providers. So perhaps the next slide would be good. So our solution, I suppose, or the beginnings of a solution, one should know the promise. Um, so the platform, the idea is to bring together users and providers of text analytics. By providers, I mean, uh, or we mean researchers who are quite good at developing scripts for processing and text data mining. And there's, and there's quite a few people working in the, in the sort of open access, open source world who do this. Uh, it's difficult for us to work with commercial providers. In fact, we can't um, because our commitment is to open uh, science. Um, but there are a lot of people working who are providers and there's obviously a whole bunch of users. How do you connect these people up? Um, so our aim is to develop this integrated collaborative cloud-based environment. Um, we want to use integrated notebooks platform for the actual processing and mining of text data. So the idea is each notebook does a particular task and you string together a bunch of notebooks and different workflows when you're trying to solve uh, a particular problem. Uh, but also, I think importantly, we want to be developing at the same time training resources and how to use text analytics. I think from the very beginning, um, if, if a whole range of people from different uh, uh, degrees of uh, sort of uh, skill and computational methods, um, if they can't engage with it, um, then we're not really doing our job. So it, it, we're aiming for quite a wide scope of people. We're not really aiming for the professional uh, person working, already working in this area. They should be able to figure it out themselves, actually. Um, so our aim here is, is that broader range of people in the humanities and social sciences, and also we're exploring out into the natural sciences uh, where there's folk working with text. Um, we're wanting to increase accessibility, uh, transparency, so the way we describe our notebooks is it's like a car. Um, you get in and you drive it. If you want to lift the hood and see what's how it's working, you can do that. If you'd rather just drive the car, you can do that too. Um, so that's the transparency bit. And also that the research you're doing is rep, uh, can replicate this research. Um, so the idea is really to increase uh, capacity amongst our researchers to use text analytics. Um, so the final slide. It's actually fairly simple, I noticed, compared to everyone else's slides, um, which is because we're actually aiming for a, a fairly simple uh, technological environment. It, it's really about transforming, transforming research uh, by people getting to use these techniques. Uh, we know the promise of them, but they just aren't used enough by researchers uh, in many disciplines. Um, so the technology is really just Jupyter Notebooks, uh, which incorporate these open source scripts for cleaning, transforming, analyzing, visualizing, mining text data. Um, we have a data sandbook, a sandbox where researchers can import their own text data sets, um, which remains secure there. Um, we'd also like to start working on how we might access national collections uh, through, through, uh, through AAF, um, which, which we, we can do already in some cases. And the last, which is actually very simple technology, is a web-based online training environment which connects in. So the idea is people brought in 
through a web-based training environment, you're brought into this mysterious world of Jupyter Notebooks, I say mysterious for lots of people in humanities and social sciences, um, and so you're kind of led into it progressively. And on the other side, um, this is our um, kind of conceptual structure at this point. Thanks. Thanks very much, Michael. Okay, now we have Bill Pascoe. Hi, hello everyone. I'm uh, Bill Pascoe from um, TLC Map at the University of Newcastle. I'm the system architect. Um, TLC Map is a plat uh, digital humanities platform for spatio-temporal mapping um, uh, problems. Yeah. So one of the problems we have in humanities is that individual researchers often have very different and idiosyncratic projects and needs um, across disciplines and individuals. Um, and also that uh, although in humanities we can use um, scientific and mathematical methods, uh, we're not limited to that. And there's some pretty fundamental metaphysical and epistemological differences to um, STEM fields, which I won't go into in only three minutes. Uh, but because GIS tends to have a, a STEM focus or a commercial focus, we often find that there's gaps in what we'd really like to do and what is possible to do. Um, so, I mean, you would normally find that because needs are idiosyncratic, then you require a uh, bespoke solution, but that's really expensive. And in humanities, we don't have very big budgets. Um, so uh, another issue is there tends to be a lack of cultural layers in um, data sources. So for example, national map, if you go there, there's lots of great information about um, science and uh, various areas in science, uh, but there's not much culture. And also, um, if you go to Google, you'll find lots of uh, commercial layers, but not so much in the way of culture. Um, and another issue is that uh, in Australia, there's a, like a general lack of meaning of place um, compared to other countries anyway. Uh, you know, in, in we grow up in homogenous suburbs and go to homogenous offices. We don't really know much about our, um, the history of a place and its importance, and that affects how we value things and how we understand our place in the world. Um, and it's kind of ironic that there's uh, that situation since the idea of country and connection to it is so important in Indigenous culture. Um, and so in trying to address that, we do prioritise um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander projects and um, First Nations. Uh, so next slide. Um, solutions. So humanities researchers need easy to use tools. Uh, they usually don't have the time or inclination to learn a whole GIS system or to get deep into mathematics. Um, so if we could automate some basic common things, um, that would probably have a, a great impact for humanities. Um, but there remains that problem of idiosyncratic needs. It's hard to find things that are common. Um, so what we did was we looked at the different types of digital mapping activity in humanities, uh, from natural language processing to virtual reality. There's all kinds of different things. It's not just putting dots on a map. Um, and tried to identify what the next step would be um, in each area and then prioritize all of that. We don't want to build one thing that tries to do everything um, or to make a new GIS system and repeat functionality. Um, we, we try to add to or modify existing systems where possible and build new systems where there's a lack. Uh, by looking at this as a software ecosystem, we're able to let each system do what it does well at the same time as ensuring there's a wide range of functionality for different areas. So that means we have to focus on interoperability um, and produce some relatively simple criteria for TLC map compliance so that you can, a user can take uh, data from one system process it in another system and then take it from there and put it in another system depending on what their needs are. And you might go from text analytics all the way over to virtual reality, for example. Um, and we also try to ensure that uh, 
our developments are, are practical solutions by using rapid prototyping and ensuring we don't um, develop any platform that doesn't have a project as a proof, proof of concept and um, to put it to a real world test. And also make sure that any project we're doing, um, we do that in such a way as that the software can be reused for other similar projects. So in terms of impact, we hope that this means there's um, humanities issue temporal and that the general public will benefit from being able to easily see and access and appreciate that research. Uh, next slide. So um, in terms of the technical architecture, there's probably not too much um, that's strange or unexpected for people working in research at um, universities in software development, um, MariaDB, MySQL, Postgres, that sort of thing. Uh, <clears throat> probably the thing worth mentioning that are a little unusual are um, that we contribute some development to allow other systems that are not under our control to be interoperable and enhance some of their features rather than trying to do everything ourselves. Uh, and well, it's worth mentioning also that um, the strategy of uh, working in a sort of a, a ecosystem approach does have the drawback of complexity in that we have to learn and support so many different technologies. Um, and also I added people there just as a, a reminder the machines that work Apple. Architecture, you do need to con consider who's going to support that. Um, so that's all from Thanks, Bill. Sorry, you're breaking up a bit, so I'm just thinking you're finished. Yeah, sorry. I hope I just might, wasn't talking. Yeah. No, no, it might be me. No, no, it might be me. The Wi-Fi can be a bit flaky in here, um, oh, okay. even though I'm in the office. <laughs> Thanks very much. Okay. Thanks. Oops, sorry. Okay, uh, now we have Marissa Takahashi. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so hello everyone. Marisa Takahashi from Queensland University of Technology, or QUT. Um, QUT is the project lead for this Australian Digital Observatory, and our partners are the University of Melbourne, University of New South Wales, Queensland Cyber Infrastructure, in, uh, Cyber Infrastructure Foundation, and Google Cloud. Um, I would like to thank ARDC for co-investing in this project. Next slide, please, Gary. Okay, so um, in recent years, researchers from both social and natural sciences have started to incorporate dynamic digital data into their research. Uh, we define dynamic digital data as continuously streamed data from technical platforms, such as social media platforms like Twitter and Facebook, and gaming platforms such as Stream, or other continuously updated data over the World Wide Web. There are many challenges facing researchers who want to use this type of data. For, in, for instance, data collection can be costly, which is a big barrier for researchers with limited funds. And those researchers who are less technically savvy face issues ranging from data pre-processing, storage, and extraction of the relevant data set. And even when they have the data, they still face the issue of analyzing this type of data. They may need support in the selection and the execution of appropriate data analytic tools. And further challenges involve data governance, which covers the ethics of using and sharing this data. And finally, we have researchers doing ad hoc collections. And uh, with this type of collections, there's, there is the issue of data quality and replicability of research. Uh, to determine the demand for the type of service that we plan to offer in this platform, we sought an expression of interest from researchers from various universities across Australia, and we received an overwhelming support for the establishment of this type of platform service, as you can see from the user base list. Next slide, please, Gary. 
So to solve, <clears throat> to solve this challenge as mentioned, our project aims to establish the Australian Digital Observatory, which will be a national platform providing data bank and data services to researchers seeking to work with dynamic digital data. So the benefits gained from establishing an Australia-wide platform are reasonable cost and availability of the data sets, technical and analytical data services to researchers, thus enabling them to focus on their research. In, and incorporating dynamic digital data can provide new methods and insights, thus enabling new forms of research. There is also cost effectiveness that can be achieved by pooling resources across various universities. And finally, Achieving a critical concentration of skills and expertise will enable us to establish a community of practice. So these benefits will create impact by transforming and accelerating research projects that use and analyze dynamic digital data sets. Another impact would be the creation of an interdisciplinary team of researchers and support staff at key locations in Australia who can provide transferable skill sets to support innovative projects across many research locations. Next slide, please. So this is not the technical architecture, but rather a functional architecture of the Australian Digital Observatory. As you can see, there will be four components, the data sources where we will be ingesting the dynamic, dynamic digital data from, the digital observatory platform that will be the back end technical implementation of the functions described there, which then enables the front end portion consisting of the data bank and data services, which we will then offer to the research communities. So the data will be collected from various data sources as shown, uh, depending on the demand from the researchers. Data can be collected via APIs and web archiving, again, depending on the relevant terms of service. We envision three distributed data nodes uh, in Queensland, New South Wales, and Victoria. Accordingly, the data bank will be distributed data banks at each of these nodes, but we will operate with a harmonized data governance, which will provide oversight on ethics and data sharing protocols. So the, rest, the researchers can avail of the data services, such as data engineering, through to data analytics, depending on their needs. As interface to researchers, there will be a formal process of project onboarding, as well as designated access protocols. Of course, training and support will also be provided to researchers. And finally, we will be designing and implementing a business model to ensure sustainability of the platform beyond the current ARDC funding cycle. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marissa. And finally, we have Tom Johnston. Tom, we can't. Okay. Yeah. How is how is this? Any better? Am I coming through or not? Yes, you should yes. be through. Okay. Um, I'm not actually seeing any um, shared. Oh, you. I, I guess you're restarting the. Um, I'll just wait to that uh, that comes up on my screen. No problem. Sorry, I was muted. That's why you couldn't help hear me saying that. There you go. These are the latest slides. No problem. Oh, Thanks a lot. It hasn't worked. I should mention go. to everybody, this is my fault for getting the slides done so late. So um, it's certainly not Kerry's. Um, anyway, so I'll, I'll, I won't waste any time. I'll get started just talking. Um, I'm Tom Johnston. I'm a professor of cognitive neuroscience at Swinburne University. Um, and at Swinburne, we're also a node of the National Imaging Facility. Uh, and our focus at Swinburne really is on um, MEG and EEG data. So that's magnetoencephalography data and electroencephalography data and related techniques using electrophysiology. And the platform that we've established um, is really addressing the need um, across across the electrophysiology, EEG and MEG uh, research communities um, for an advanced analysis platform or solution because currently there simply isn't one, um, unlike many other um, uh, domains of research. Now, 
partly this probably reflects a bit of the history of EEG research, which is where it really things started. The research groups themselves are very diverse. They span industry and clinical settings. Um, within medical field outside of it, uh, there are researchers, you know, spanning from uh, artificial intelligence engineering and looking at robotics and brain computer interfaces uh, to many, many researchers in fields in psychology, such as social psychology, sports psychology. And the challenge there, of course, is that their, their backgrounds are academic backgrounds, their level of technical um, um, expertise and experience is vastly different. Uh, many, many of the researchers come from relatively small labs spread out across the country. Uh, and they have limited access and experience with Linux systems, with supercomputers, um, and most of them, uh, most especially from the, the more the psychology side um, of fields, are locked into proprietary software that was made available, provided with the hardware they use to acquire the data. And uh, whilst that worked okay in the early days, of course, that sort of proprietary software hasn't moved with the times. It doesn't often um, encompass the most advanced techniques that are available for analysis. And it certainly doesn't uh, allow for very much uh, interchange of data, sharing of data, sharing of analysis pipelines. Um, and reproducibility is pretty awful because once somebody's software license um, goes out of date or uh, the software they have a license for only runs on a Windows 95 computer and not even beyond that, um, then there's absolutely no hope to actually reproduce the sorts of analyses that they've done. And that's really the, the existing state in many, many places. Um, really in stark contrast to that, there is a lot of open source software that wasn't available 10 years ago that is now widely available for uh, analysis of these types of data and it's rapidly expanding. It's largely based on Python and various Python toolboxes. Uh, it increasingly focuses on combining um, EEG, MEG, electrophysiology data with other types of data, such as imaging data from MRI, um, but also peripheral measures of physiology that are commonly acquired. And so really the challenge here is trying to address this need for a powerful, um, open uh, analysis platform that allows for reproducible and shareable analyses, but one that is easy and accessible and portable that can be used by people in these small labs with very few uh, technical resources, if you like. Okay. So our approach really, simplicity is underlying everything here. Everything has to be made simple for people to use. Um, we want a portable working environment that can be installed on somebody's own PC, on a workstation in their lab, on a virtual machine in the cloud, say on a Nectar virtual machine, um, but also can run on a, uh, on a supercomputer, um, giving them access or ability to scale their analyses from um, you know, small data sets up to large data sets, from simple analyses up to more complex ones. Um, we want to containerize the open source software that is available. And we want to provide automated container building and sharing for new analytic pipelines so that when people develop a pipeline, they don't have to worry about the technicalities of, of building containers using Docker um, or Singularity. We want something that's far simpler than that. More than anything else, we want something they can install with basically one command on their computer, and then they just launch into it and make it work. And through this, we're hoping that we can foster the creation of far more findable structured data in EEG um, and MEG reproducible analysis pipelines, which really lag behind, for example, um, neuroimaging, um, and create a platform that's accessible by researchers from a wide, wide diversity of settings, including regional universities um, and small labs with less technical staff. Uh, we've built in interoperability with other analysis platforms such as the Australian Imaging Service, the Characterization Virtual Library, um, also Brain Life, which is a, a, an, an effort that's been supported by the NIH in the United States, uh, based in Indiana. And through this, we hope that there 
of uh, analyses can be scaled up to address some major challenges um, because the data itself is, is extremely valuable in fields such as epilepsy, stroke, uh, traumatic brain injury and dementia. Yep. This is a little bit of the, the architectural diagram. And you can see here what we're trying to do is cater for people who either operate the columns basically represent different types of analysis, um, uh, different types of analysis approaches. Um, so we have interactive processing in the middle, in the middle um, column there where there's a requirement for low latency visualization of fairly complex data. The data sets, however, might be quite small. And this is the sort of thing that people can typically do um, on their own uh, PC or on their own workstation in the lab. Uh, but we also want to provide the ability to um, provide to, to have interactive processing and more computationally intensive uh, small and large data sets. And here we might need things such as GPU enabled virtual machines. Uh, we also might, uh, we also want to integrate what we're doing with the characterization virtual lab, which can sit on top of a high performance computer system, uh, giving them all the oomph that that provides. Uh, on the other side, we also want to provide them an easy transition into batch processing um, for computationally intensive and repetitive um, data set analyses. And here's where we are integrating with the Australian Imaging Service, um, but also BrainLife.io, which is this um, US-based platform. Um, and the vertical stream you see down the middle gives you some idea of our approach here. And it starts off with a very lightweight Linux desktop, which can be pretty much installed anywhere, as I said, with one command. Um, that's based upon an open platform architecture called Neurodesk, which has been developed for brain imaging, and we're expanding into this, in the, to this domain of analysis. And then we want um, an easy containerization system where people can check, uh, check out containers or download containers easily from the registry uh, and know that those are going to function because they're running on the same basic platform as everybody else. Uh, and uh, with that, I've, I've swept through this very, very quickly, uh, but hopefully that gives you a picture for what we're doing. You can see on the standards on the right there, some of the standards we're doing, the bids, especially the brain imaging data set format has now, a data structure format has been extended to electrophysiology, psychophysiology, MEG and EEG. And that is built into our platform by default. So all the all the pipelines that we're going to provide uh, in containerized form will be compliant with bids, which we think will be um, reproducible and uh, open and accessible of the platform. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tom. And thank you to everyone who um, who's presented today and thanks to all of you who have come along to hear about these fantastic platforms. Um, some really exciting projects here.